يضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد so we carry on with the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, as we said today in, uh, in the khutbah, that the stories that we talk about and that we mention are not meant merely for entertainment. The point here is to study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and learn from it. Learn lessons that we can benefit from in our daily life, in our personal and public life. Uh, one of the tabi'in, I think it was Aban ibn Uthman, uh, he said, Kunna nata'allamu uh, al-maghazi kama kunna nata'allamu al-surata min al-Qur'an. We were taught the maghazi, sort of the battles of the Prophet which is part of the life of the Prophet And the maghazi is a general name. So yes, it refers to the battles, but it also refers to other of the uh, some other details of the life of the Prophet sallallahu so he said we used to learn these maghazi which is the life of the Prophet sallallahu as we used to learn surahs from the Quran so they used to teach them who was Aban ibn Uthman Aban is the son of Uthman is the son of Uthman radiyallahu anhu so he's from the generation of a tabi'in considered to be the generation of a tabi'in and Aban was one of for those who know the Fuqaha of Medina, al Fuqaha al Sab'a, the seven Fuqaha scholars of Medina, Aban ibn Uthman was one of them. We have Aban here. So, uh, so they used to learn the life of the Prophet, ﷺ, not just to memorize it, place it in their heads, but it's just to learn from it. There are so many lessons there. As we quoted the verse in Surah Yusuf, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Indeed, in their stories, there have been lessons. And we said ibra in the Arabic language comes from, from the root abara. Abara means to cross over to the other side. And this means whatever lessons you learn from a story, you're supposed to cross over into your life. So bring them into your life, internalize them, personalize them, uh, seize them, benefit from them on a, at a personal level. <clears throat> so we said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that time, <clears throat> he was in his mid-twenties when he got married to Khadija radiyallahu anha. He got married and we, we talked about the story. We said at this time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a young man in Mecca, he started to secure his place as one of the respected men, young men in Mecca. He became known as Al-Amin. That was his nickname, Al-Amin. So if you say Al-Amin in Mecca, automatically people uh, think of Muhammad. They think of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that time, he developed his own business and he bought a slave. He bought a slave to himself. And we said slavery was all over the world. The whole world had this slavery phenomena it was there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi bought uh, a man called Zayd as a slave, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam freed him. He freed him. He said, you're free. And then he gave him the option to stay with him and be his adopted son. And he agreed to this. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam named him Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd, the son of Muhammad. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So he became the servant. He became sort of the personal assistant of the Prophet ﷺ because he was considered to be his son. And adoption was uh, a normal phenomenon at that time. So people could adopt and this son could become like your blood son. So one day, uh, Zayd ibn Muhammad at the time, and we said the Arabs had some, some of the remnants of the religion of Ibrahim. So they performed Hajj, they performed Tawaf, they performed Sa'i. They had these uh, rituals and these acts of worship, but they, were, they mixed them up with the worship of idols. So in Tawaf, as we do in Tawaf nowadays, we go around seven times. And during the Tawaf, we make Dua. You can recite Quran, you can make Dhikr, you can make Dua, call upon Allah, ask Allah for whatever you want. People of Quraysh added to that something else. On ca calling upon Allah and calling upon the Asnam, the idols. 
calling and also something else and that was touching and rubbing their hands against the asnam the idols why seeking blessings seeking blessings so muhammad وسلم, at that time before revelation he was making tawaf around the kaaba and his adopted son zaid was with him so zaid out of habit like everyone else he puts his hand on one of the idols called isaf there was two couple idols one was male one was females one was one was male one was female isaf and naila one of the two asnam around the kaaba isaf and naila isaf was the male naila was the female and the legend goes that these were two a man and a woman a couple who had a really unlawful relationship outside of marriage and then they what they turned into stone that was the the tradition that's what at least the tradition said that's what the legend says so they were asnam but they were just asnam and uh, they were made of copper they were, these were made of copper so zayd ibn harith like the people of Quraysh, he goes uh, close to isaf and he rubs his hand against isaf the prophet وسلم, looks at him that's before revelation he said don't ever do this again don't ever do this again and he was angry with him then they kept making the tawaf so being a young man zaid at that time he said i'm gonna do it again i'll see how far he goes <laughs> i'm gonna see how far he goes so in arabic he says فقلت في نفسي لا أمسنه حتى أنظر ما يكون. I said to myself, I'm gonna touch it. I'll see what he does next. So the second round, he touches it again. So the Prophet ﷺ says, ألم تنها? Didn't I tell you not to do that? So he was more angry with him. So now Zaid he says, والله his hand never touched an idol. The hand of the Prophet ﷺ, the blessed hand of the Prophet ﷺ, never touched an idol. So that's basically that shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided Muhammad from a young age not to engage in anything that was haram, anything that was against the, the truth. He didn't engage in anything that was against the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the authentic tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which was Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. And this shows as well, Because this establishes something with the people, and we're going to come to this point. It's a very important point that actually pertains to our times. The Prophet ﷺ was seen by the people of Quraysh who someone who, as someone who doesn't follow heresies, which are innovations in religion, bid'ah. So the Arabs knew, the Arabs knew, the religion of Ibrahim did not have idols. They knew that. They knew that drinking alcohol was forbidden and haram. In the religion of Ibrahim they knew that zina and any relationships outside of wedlock were haram but still they practiced them and still they attributed them to Ibrahim to the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam but that's the state of denial that's a state of denial that that they lived in and this is what led them to ghafla but anyway but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet ﷺ from all of these things why because the Prophet ﷺ is gonna call them to the opposite of all these mistakes and it's the nature of people that when they are called to something or when they are invited to something which most likely they will have resistance to if they cannot if they cannot attack the message they will attack the messenger they will attack the message and this is one tactic that is used uh, in the media today and this is studied by the way under what they call fallacies Fallacy, there's a science in rhetoric, it's called fallacies, is how to manipulate people's thinking, okay, in order to control them. One of them, if anyone, an advocate of an idea, you don't, if the idea is so powerful, is so appealing that it's hard to critique it, it's hard to find loopholes in it, what you can do instead, attack the messenger, the, the advocate of it, the one who's calling people to it. So that's why you find a lot of people are attacking the Prophet ﷺ now. They try to find something against the Prophet ﷺ in his life so they can attack him and automatically discredit his message. And this works with a lot of naive people, a lot of misinformed people, people who don't, who don't invest in reading and finding out about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. 
So they will say, Muhammad وسلم, did such and such. He married Aisha and she was at this and that age. And he did this and he did that. And he suffered from this, he suffered from that. There are so many issues that they bring about. And the point is here, discredit the messenger. Automatically, you know, you know people will turn away from the message. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preemptively dealt with this with the people of Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ did not have a bad history. He had no dark history. You know, sometimes you find someone who's come to practicing Islam and Alhamdulillah, Allah guided them. They started practicing Islam, started learning the Quran, learning Hadith. Now they're going to tell, maybe first and foremost, they're going to turn, they're going to turn to their family. They will turn to their family in advice. So they will go to their parents and you know what happens. That's the typical story, right? The son comes to the father, you know, why are you dressing up like this? Why, why are you praying like this? And so on and so forth. The same story happens over and over again. Now, in defense, usually what the family says, you telling us about Salah? You telling us about being a good Muslim? You did such and such in your past, right? You were this kind of person. And now again, everyone, when they start practicing, they start advising people, people will say, uh -huh, you remember five years ago what you did? So with the Prophet ﷺ, Allah SWT preemptively dealt with all of this. So the Prophet, this is why when the Prophet ﷺ came about, it was very difficult for the people of Quraysh to find any accusation, any kind of loopholes in his character, in his history. Such a bright history. The honest, he's known as the trustworthy, al Amin. His history with them is so clean and pristine. There's nothing about it. There's no, like there, nothing could tarnish his personal history. The Prophet ﷺ never engaged in polytheism, in the worship of Islam. He never called upon anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his history was clean. And this gives credit. For who? For those who seek the truth. Those who seek the truth, when they see the integrity of the messenger, it's, it makes it easier for them to connect to the message and figure it out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with that already. So this is why here Zayd ibn Haritha says, uh, about the Prophet ﷺ, he says, فَوَالَّذِي أَكْرَمَهُ وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ مَسْتَلَمَ صَنَمًا حَتَّى أَكْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ بِالَّذِي أَكْرَمَهُ بِهِ وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيْهِ His hand never touched uh, an idol in his life until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the message uh, upon him. And in something else, you know, people of Mecca, they had the Hajj, they had the pilgrimage, Quraysh, they had the pilgrimage. Pretty much a lot of what we do today in Hajj was done there. Why? Because it's, that's the tradition of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as -salam. It was there. It was uh, making tawaf and sa'i, standing in Arafat, uh, sleeping in Muzdalifa, uh, spending three days in Mina, and the tawaf again, same thing. But the Arabs added a lot of idolatry. They added a lot of paganism to these rituals. One of the innovations or one of the heresies and the bid'ahs that the people of Quraysh introduced is that all the people who came from around the Arabian Peninsula on the day of Arafah would stand in Arafat. Quraysh did not stand in Arafat. They stood outside Arafat in Muzdalifa. They said, why? Because we are the protectors of the Haram. We are not like anyone else. We have this different privilege. We stand in Muzdalifa. Only people from Quraysh were allowed to do this. But this was an introduction, or this was, as we said, an innovation in the religion. The Prophet Wasallam, even during, during, before receiving the message, he would stand with people in Arafah, in Hajj, with the rest of the Arabs, unlike the people of Quraysh. And they blamed him for that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was still guiding him. So the Prophet ﷺ was, he felt this kind, he felt being strange in Mecca. Why? Because people, we said idolatry, paganism, worship of the idols became like so ingrained in their way of life that it has tarnished everything. It has contaminated every aspect of their life. The whole culture started building on idolatry and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their practices, their business, their trade, there was a lot of oppression, a lot of injustice, a lot of favoritism. And it was all about uh, their religion. It was all interconnected as a very powerful cultural system. The Prophet was hard for them to, it was, it was hard for him to fit in, to feel part 
of these people. So he felt himself to be a stranger there. And this is why he started withdrawing. He started withdrawing. Towards his, mid, his 30s, mid-30s, the Prophet ﷺ started to withdraw. So he developed the habit of what we call Al-Tahannuth. The Arab called it Al-Tahannuth. And the Arabs had this act of worship, which is some sort of seclusion and isolation. A person would withdraw from civilization and they would go into a cave on top of a mountain or in the desert or in the woods in some kind of natural place where there is no uh, civilization, no uh, like population. They would be by themselves trying to figure out, trying to think or answer the big questions about life. What is life about? What's the meaning of our life? What am I doing here? What's the point of me coming to this world and then leaving? And these are questions. Any, when you study the, the history of any nation, you're going to find clues of this. Why? Because these, what they call them existential questions, are so central to us. There is a need inside us, and that's what we call fitrah. There is an, there's an urge, there is a, a quest inside all of us to figure out what this life is all about. And most people live in denial to these questions. This is why people medicate themselves with video games, with smoking, with drinking, partying, busy lifestyle, social life, social media. People want to keep their minds, their heads spinning. They want to keep their minds busy. Why? Because the moment they have some time by themselves, this quest is going to emerge from the hearts. It's going to say, what are you doing here? What's the point behind your life? Why did you come into existence? What's the meaning of this whole creation? Why, is it, why, why has it all been put together? What's the point behind it? These are questions that you cannot escape from. The only way is to keep yourself in this kind of rat race or this treadmill of life where you're completely busy with daily distractions, daily distractions, daily distractions. So you do not get a moment of silence where you listen inside. But the Arabs had this and it had an impact on them. So we have among the Arabs people who refused paganism, who refused idolatry, who refused this lifestyle and they refused this kind of twisted religion that the Arabs had. One of the most famous of them was a man called Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. You know, mark this name. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. He was one of the people of Quraysh, a nobleman in Quraysh. He was known for, for a couple of things. One of them, you know, some of the Arabs had the habit because, you know, just keep in mind as well, we're talking about the Arabian Peninsula 1500 years ago. People at that time, there was a lot of tribal feuds and wars. And sometimes tribes would attack one another. And what this meant, killing men, taking children and women as captives. It wasn't only the Arabian Peninsula. In the Arabian Peninsula, it was predominantly a tribal thing. One tribe against the other, or one faction against the other. In, others, in other uh, countries, it was the government doing that. So you have the Byzantine Empire, it was doing that to the people in what we call today natural Syria, and what's known today as Turkey. So people were oppressed by the government. They were considered to be low-class citizens. They had no rights. And there were the uh, landlords or the people who owned the lands. Everyone else was working for them and was barely, you know, just getting the basics of their life because they were considered to be lesser kind of creation. A lesser kind of, so this kind of caste system was there. In Persia, it was the same. But among the Arabs, it was this kind of feuds and this kind of uh, oppression was taken... Uh, the shape of tribal wars. So when a tribe attacked another tribe, they would kill their fighter men and they would take the younger ones as captives and sell them as slaves. And they would take their women as well and sell, sell them as slaves. This is how it happened. So the Arabs had a very powerful and predominant sense of honor to, and protection towards their women, their females. So for them, it was such a big disgrace to a tribe that any woman of them is taken as a captive. It would be a disgrace. Some of them would even kill themselves because of that. So they wanted to avoid that. Some of them wanted to avoid this by if they had a, a baby girl, they would get rid of her straight away. They would just get rid of her. We don't want her to grow up. Then she gets taken as captive. 
we don't want her to go through this. So for them, they thought it made sense. So some of them would have this practice. So Zayd ibn Amr ibn Fayl was known for him as a social sort of worker, social he himself was a social institution there. So he kept in, good, in touch with everyone. Anytime he heard someone had a baby girl, he would watch them. And if he could read any early signs that this man had an intention to bury that daughter or get rid of her, he would approach him straight away. He said, if you don't want her, I will take her. No one will know that she's your daughter. I'll take her and adopt her as my own daughter. I will take care of her. I'll provide for her until she becomes an adult. Then when she becomes an adult, I will contact you. If you want to take her back, take her back. If you don't want to take her back, you want to disown her completely, she will be my daughter. You have nothing to do with her. But don't kill her. Don't murder her. He was known for this. And it's amazing how one person could do this in such kind of a society, a tribal society. But he was very successful in that. He was known for that. He has a beautiful story about religion, about, the, about life, what life means, and about worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he traveled. He was very uh, disenchanted with the religious life in the Arabian Peninsula. So he decided to search for religion outside. So he figured out the Arabs were all upon the same thing. So he decided to travel to Iraq, to Syria, to find out if there is any true revelation from Allah. Where are the remains of the religion of Ibrahim? He knew that the religion of Ibrahim was the true religion. So he wanted that. But there was no clue about it, except what the Arabs had. So he travels to Iraq and Syria and he meets some Jews, some Jewish rabbis. And he tells them, basically, I want to... I want to know what your religion is because you claim it's a, it's a divinely it's a divine religion it's from Allah. She said yes indeed. But in order in order for you to join us they gave him some conditions that seemed to be out of the question for him. He said basically uh, because they said you can't get the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something like this. So he said no I'm searching for the mercy of Allah so it doesn't make sense that you call me to the anger of Allah or to get the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he moved on and he found some Christian priests and uh, hermits and he asked them about their religion what do you guys follow they said we just for us you have to accept the original sin you have to accept that you are faulty by nature by default and then you obviously you have to accept the trinity and so on and so forth so you can purify yourself he said no, i'm running away from sin and from the original sin you want to just give me that kind of stamp i'm not going to take it so he said but i'm searching for the worship of the only creator so the message that he got from uh, some of the rabbis and the priests that he met was, it seems you're searching for the religion of Ibrahim. So he said, well, what's the religion of Ibrahim exactly? They said, Kana Hanifa. He was upon the straight path. He would worship only Allah and he would distance himself from the anger of Allah or from the original sin. It was a, a religion of sub submission. He said, that's what I want. That's what I'm searching for. And that shows that we humans are born with a sense of fitrah. A sense of fitra, a strong sense of fitra. What is fitra? Fitra, as Ibn Abbas عنه, explains it, he said, Al fitra al Islam. When you are born, as the Prophet says in the authentic hadith reported by Al Bukhari, Kullu yuladu ala al fitra. Each human being, when they're born, they're born in a state of fitra. You're born Muslim. Every human being is born Muslim. What does that mean? You know Allah in your heart. You know. And you seek Allah. And you know deep in your heart, it's not an intellectual knowledge, it's intuitive knowledge. It's in your gut. It's much deeper and stronger than intellectual knowledge. It's much deeper. It's, 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 uh, it's in your core, in the core of your being. You know it. So you know Allah is there. You know that this life is temporary and it's not the whole thing. You know you've been created for a, for a, for a, a wise reason and for a purpose. And that you, um, you have a sense of responsibility to fulfill the purpose of your existence. You have this. It's a knowing. It's not something that you learn from the outside world. You're born with it. But you just have to tune into it. You have to listen to it. You have to, be, you have to detach yourself from distractions so you can hear that voice of the fitrah calling upon you. And this fitrah as well has all the ethical principles. And this explains why all of us humanity, we all agree on the ethical principles. There is no one in this, anyone in their sound mind, no one would distance themselves from justice. No one would say justice is bad. No one would say this. No one would say kindness as a principle is bad. 
You might disagree with how you act on kindness or where you manifest kindness, but that's a situational factor. We're talking about kindness as a principle. No one would argue that uh, forgiveness is a good thing. No one would argue that helping out others is a good thing. No one, would, no one wants to be called a thief or a liar. We all intuitively, and that's our fitrah, knows that these, are, these things are wrong. So that shows that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed us, He designed us all Muslim. He designed us all upon the truth. We, he designed us all with principles and ethics. So this was very obvious in the life of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. So when he was told about Ibrahim and he said, how, how do I find followers of Ibrahim? They said, they're extinct. There's none of them alive. But, and that's the knowledge of the people of the scripture. They had some signs in the scripture, in the Torah and in the gospels. They had signs about the time, the eminent, uh, the time when the Prophet was eminent, when his prophethood was, when he was about to be sent. And they could read the signs. So they were ready, they were actually anxious and they were anticipating that the Prophet would be sent around this time. And we're going to explain some, uh, mention some examples actually, where some of the uh, pr uh, priests, some of the uh, scholars of the Christians and the Jews, they moved to Medina, to Yathrib. Why? And Yathrib was a desert, but Asham, which is Syria, Jordan, Palestine today, that was the best part or the, the best country to live or the best area to live in at that time. It was so fertile. Now it's much, you know, it, it, desertation has taken, it, taken over. But it was a very fertile, very rich in all resources. The best lifestyle, the best living standards were in that area. So a lot of these priests, rabbis, they left tribes, whole tribes, left that area, left Palestine. Why? To Yathrib. Because in their books, they knew this was the time of the final prophet to be sent. And we want to be there, so hopefully he would come from among us. That's why they traveled, traveled to the desert. To the, and they, some of them explained, like someone called Ibn al-Hayyiban, was a very respected man, Jewish rabbi in Medina, in Yathrib. Himself, when he was dying, he said to his people, he said, do you know why I left the land of fertility and vegetation and civilization and came to this desert? That's what he says on his deathbed. They said, why? He said, because it's time for a prophet to be sent and I was hoping to see him, to meet him. This is why he came here. But he died before the Prophet ﷺ was known. So, Zayd ibn Amr al-Nufayl was told, there is no followers, true followers of Ibrahim, of the religion of Ibrahim now, but there's good news. Where you come from, where you come from, a prophet is very likely to be sent around these times. So go back where you came from. So the, 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 the competition was in their minds, in their interpretation, of the people of the scripture, their interpretation was, it was either Yathrib, which is later, later on became to be known as Al-Madina, or Mecca. But they were leaning more towards Yathrib, which was obviously where the Prophet ﷺ migrated. So Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl comes back to Mecca and he resides in Mecca waiting for the Prophet to appear. Waiting for the Prophet to appear. Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, she said, I remember as a little girl, I remember seeing Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl in Mecca sitting near Al Kaaba shouting at the people of Mecca, he says, Ya Quraysh, Laysa minkum ahadun ala millati Ibrahim illa ana. He says to them, O oh Quraysh, none of you is upon the religion of Ibrahim except for me. You guys have adopted so many, you know, twisted stuff that you are no longer on the religion of Ibrahim. It's only me. Then he said, he used to say, Ya Rabb, law a'rifu ala ayyi wajhin a'buduk la'abadduk. Lakinnani la a'rifu illa hadha. So he used to say, oh Allah, if I know how to worship you, I would do it. But I don't know. The only thing I know that I feel I could worship you is by doing like this. So he would put his forehead on his palm, making sujood. That's the only thing he could figure out by himself. Because there's no revelation. It's only his fitrah calling him. That's a powerful call of the fitrah. And this is what happens when humans really start to pay attention to what Allah put inside them. And imagine when you add on top of this, the guidance of the revelation. The reason why most people don't benefit from the Quran is that their minds are busy. 
the minds are busy and attached. The minds are busy and attached. And this is why when the mind is busy, because the Quran, when you hear it, when you read it, when you learn it, it goes through your ears or through your eyes if you read, into your mind, into your brain. And if your brain is absorbent, is not busy, is not overwhelmed with distractions, it becomes receptive. When it's receptive, it, ta receptive, it takes it to your heart. When it takes it your heart, to your heart, the Quran meets your fitrah, and that's when the magic happens. That's when guidance happens. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he warned against the khawarij, he warned against the khawarij, what did he say? He said, al Quran. They recite the Quran, لا يجاوز تراقيهم. They recite the Quran, but it doesn't go beyond their collarbone. Here. What does that mean? The scholars said the Quran stays in their tongue, in their heads, but it never travels to the heart. It never travels to the heart. Because it has to go to the heart to awaken the fatrah. So the deviation of the khawarij came from the fact that they took the Quran as recitation and intellectual understanding, but they did not allow it to go into their heart to awaken the fitrah and let it unfold and inform it. That's why, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he says, qawamu sharia And there's a very important statement. He says, qawamu sharia إِنَّمَا هُوَ بِالْفِطْرَةِ الْمُكَمَّلَةِ بِالشَّرِيعَةِ الْمُنَزَّلَةِ He says, the reality of Islam, the, how Islam really comes about into someone's life is by the fitrah that is completed and complemented by the revelation by the sharia that is sent down so it's not that oh you put the quran in your head that's it no you have to take the quran to heart you have to take the quran to heart this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna fi dhalik, when allah talks uh, about some of his signs he says inna fi dhikra liman kana lahu qalb Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, in these, in everything that we mentioned, there is a reminder. There is a reminder for everyone who has a heart. What does that mean? The fitrah is in the heart. If your heart is alive and the fitrah is there, and so this, what you hear from the Quran is going to fall into your fitrah, is going to remind you, it's going to awaken you. So you will awaken from the state of ghafla or heedlessness. Or if he doesn't have a living heart yet, but at least this person is searching. So they open their ears to listen attentively. So no distractions. The channel is open. It goes through the ear, into the mind, then it goes into the heart. That's when the Quran benefits. Apart from this, it doesn't benefit. Ibn al-Qayyim has a beautiful kind of explanation on this simple verse. And he actually, that's the beginning of his book, Al-Fawaid. That's the first note. In his book Al-Fawaid, he talks about this and he explains how the revelation, how it meets the fitrah. That's when it, as we said, this is when the magic starts. So back to Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, as we said, this is how he lived his life. Do you know what his reward is? This thing with Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, by the way, he knew the Prophet sallallahu He met him. He met him and he saw him. But he died before revelation. He died before revelation. And the Prophet ﷺ says something beautiful about him. He says, Yub'athu Zayd. The Prophet ﷺ was talking about Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Yub'athu yawm al-qiyamati ummatan wahda. He will be resurrected on the day of judgment as a nation by himself. So what does that mean? Where is he? He's in Jannah. He's a believer. He's a believer. Subhanallah. Now, uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, by the way, his son, just keep that in mind for, for your information. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, his son is Sa'id ibn Zayd. Who is Sa'id ibn Zayd? Who is Sa'id ibn Zayd? Okay, good. So we have two pieces of information. He's from the ten who are promised paradise. Al Ashar al Mubashirin bil Jannah. He's one from the ten companions who are promised paradise. He's one from Al Ashar al Mubashirin. He's also married to Fatima, the sister of Umar ibn al Khattab. So he is Umar ibn al Khattab's brother in law. And Umar ibn al Khattab like beat him down so many times because <laughs> he was a Muslim 
that pro- prior to Umar becoming a Muslim, uh, Zayd he says, "لقد رأيتني وعمر بن خط وعمر بن الخطاب." Uh, he say, <clears throat> basically, Umar bin Khattab uh, sort of hanged him on the wall. <laughs> really, hanged him on the wall. He hanged Zayd ibn Umar, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd. He hanged him on the wall, and he was punching him. That's what Umar bin Khattab did before becoming a Muslim. So Umar bin Khattab really abused him at the early stages of Islam. So that's Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, the father of Sa'id. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. There were some other people as well who were searching for the truth, like Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa ibn Nawfal, the uncle of Khadija. Anha. But Waraqa ibn Nawfal was upon Christianity. كَانَ قَدْ تَنَصَّرْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ He searched, he searched, his search led him, the best that he could find was Christianity. But we have to point out that Christianity at that time was not exactly what we know about Christianity today. So there was a lot of mixtures. There was a lot of mixtures. So there were the Unitarians still. There was a lot of Muwahideen among the Christians at that time. There was a lot of people who were still worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and they did not believe that Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, Oh Jesus, peace be upon him, they did not believe that he was God or the Son of God. They didn't believe that. So there was there were there was these people who had the Trinity, but among many of the Christians there were those who did not believe in the Trinity. So it seems that Waraqa Ibn Nawfal was upon was upon monotheism, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But what he did, he learned uh, Hebrew. So he could speak Hebrew, he could read Hebrew. So he was reading the Bible in the original language, in its original language, uh, at least at that time. So this was the religious state among the uh, among the Meccans or in Mecca. Now the Prophet وسلم, <coughs> as we said, he, start, he started taking to the cave, going to the top of the mountain, having what we call the tahannuth, having this kind, this moment or these times of seclusion, isolation, he'd be by himself, just really contemplating the creation, what it means, what's the, what's the point behind being alive and so on and so forth. And this is a very important stage before receiving the message. And it shows the Prophet ﷺ detached from his, from the society. And this, this, by the way, this takes what we call ethical courage. Because most people are blinded what we call, uh, by what we call social evidence. People follow the majority. If a trend, okay, let's just follow everyone. And the problem is that most of this happens unconsciously. We unconsciously follow whatever is there. Whatever is there. But this shouldn't be the case. This should not be the case. Specifically with the bigger questions. With ethical questions. You cannot just follow the crowd. You cannot just flock with the herd. It's not the same. You have to hear, you have to listen to a higher source. A higher source. Revelation coupled with your fitrah, with your natural state of belief. And that's the purest, that's the best that you, as a human being, that you can reach. is to be true to your nature. So our nature is essentially pure as human beings. Our, our, our nature is is upon worship of Allah, knowledge of Allah, love of Allah, and is upon ethical principles. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the surah that we all know, surah al-teen, wa-teeni wa-zaytoon wa-tuuri sinin, wa-hada al-balad al-min. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We created man in the best, in the best what? Taqweem. Shape. Most of us automatically think physical shape. Oh, we're better than animals. Like animals walk on four, we walk on two, we can stand upright, and like our faces are more uh, symmetrical, they have more balance, and so on and so forth. That's only one side, because taqweem in Arabic means design. Design is not only physical. It's not only physical. This applies to mental, emotional, Spiritual, so man is created in the best design in every respect. Physical, emotional, 
mental, uh, you name it, spiritual, man is created in the best. This is why when you are born, you're born as Muslim. But what happens as the Prophet ﷺ says in the second half of the hadith, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ Then his parents thought every child is born in a state of fitrah, meaning Muslim, pure, in the best form, in the purest that a human being could ever be. But it's the parents through the culture, through the upbringing, that they take that child from their original state into another state. Into another state of, could be Christianity, Judaism, uh, any, any philosophy, any culture, any religion. So basically, our act of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learning Islam, the reality of it is, ju is just making our journey back to our original purity. That's the reality of it. We're making our journey back to our original purity. Look at Hajj. The Prophet says, Man hajja wa lam yarfuth wa lam yafsuq, raja'a ke yawmi wa ladathu ummuhu. The Prophet says, whoever makes Hajj and he does not engage in lewdness or uh, full language or any arguments or engage, it doesn't engage in any bad thing. When he comes back, he comes as the day he was born in terms of his slate is clean. So that's the best we are as humans when we were born. We were the best. But we take this journey to learn more about this life. But we are supposed to make the journey back to our, the purity of our fitrah. Most of us, to learn about life, we lose our way back to the fitrah. But we are supposed to learn about this life, but then use this situational knowledge, this technical knowledge about this life, in order to help our fitrah translate itself in practical terms. In practical terms. So whatever goodness Allah has put in you, it is translated into human worldly terms. That's what it means. That's why we have to go through this stage of upbringing. But so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we said, he started spending time by himself contemplating the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala, asking the bigger questions, and calling upon Allah to guide him, to show him the way, to show him the way. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam started to notice strange things. So he says, for example, he would be walking down the street. And he would hear something like a greeting, someone greeting him. He would look around, he would see nothing. And when he tried to search for the source of the, of the, of the, of the greeting, he found it was a stone. <laughs> so the Prophet says in the authentic hadith, there is a stone in Mecca, a specific stone that I know that before receiving revelation, it used to give me salam. Every time I pass by it, it gives me salam. <laughs> That's not the, whole, the only thing. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he started hearing sounds and seeing lights to the point where he really feared for himself. So he goes to Khadija. Every time he goes to Khadija, عنه, he says to her, I'm worried about myself. I hear sounds, voices, and I see lights. He was worried there was some kind of jinn possession or influence there. And the problem you're going to find some of the Orientalists, some people who take enmity, adopt enmity to the Prophet ﷺ and to Islam, they, they start digging here, they start, start, uh, they start doing, uh, you know, playing some dirty games, trying to say, okay, that shows that he wasn't mentally fit. There was something wrong with him. And the problem, all of this is interpretation. It's all interpretation. You know, when you approach someone's life or someone's behavior with pre, uh, a preconditioned mind, you already have an idea, I don't like this person, you're going to interpret whatever you, they do in a negative light. As simple as that. So they started creating these doubts. But the Prophet ﷺ simply, these, what were these? These were angels. Allah, was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing him for that moment of revelation. So the Prophet ﷺ felt there was something going on. There was something happening in his life. Something else as well was going on in his life. Especially like when he was 39. Every dream he had became true. Every dream he saw would just... Next day, he would see it as reality. That's quite shocking. It's shocking and alarming. So... It, may, it drew the Prophet's attention that everything I see in my sleep 
Next day it becomes a reality. There's something there. That's why أول ما بدأ به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الوحي كان الرؤيا الصادقة. The first like stage of revelation was seeing true dreams that would turn to be true. So that was the state of the Prophet ﷺ. And every time the Prophet ﷺ saw something like this, he would go back to Khadija رضي الله عنها and he would express his concerns. And Khadija رضي الله عنها would calm him down. She would say, don't worry about yourself. You're a principled man. You help the needy. You are... Uh, you're a person of good manners and none of these bad things could happen to you it must be something good now there are signs that Khadija radiallahu anha being the niece of Waraqa ibn Nawfal who had knowledge about revelation and obviously he was expecting a prophet to be there that she had some knowledge from her uncle and that she through that knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided her to see that in the Prophet so it seems that she was expecting Muhammad to be the final Prophet and Messenger it's obvious when you look at the narrations how Khadija was behaving towards the Prophet how good she was to him how she would comfort him at times when he when he saw strange things there's a conclusion an inevitable conclusion that Khadija knew what was going on she had a very strong hunch that this was him that this was him. Even sometimes you could take that conclusion as far as to say that even when she initiated the marriage, her interest in him, it seems she had something. She, it could, maybe it wasn't a conscious idea, but maybe it was a hunch, a gut feeling. That's very likely. So Khadija radiallahu anha was very supportive of the Prophet One thing I want to uh, bring to attention here as well. Since we're talking about Ibrah, we said Ibrah is learning the lesson then crossing over into your own life into your own circumstances the prophet found so much support from khadija so much support from khadija anha. so much support actually looking at that she was his best friend she was his best friend so every time he had a concern he had a doubt he wanted someone to talk to someone to confide in someone to listen to him he would go straight to khadija and this is how a wife should be. This is how a wife should be to her husband. And this is how a husband should be to his wife. If a husband doesn't feel safe and comfortable opening up and speaking to his wife and sharing his concerns, his most intimate and personal concerns, there's something wrong with the relationship. If the wife doesn't feel comfortable sharing her thoughts and concerns and doubts and fears with her husband, there's something there. There's, there, is, there. there isn't enough trust there. There isn't enough trust. There isn't enough uh, relationship. If a wife fears her husband's judgment, if she's going to share her ideas with him, this this relationship is not completely healthy same applies on the other side if a husband cannot trust or cannot count on his wife to go back and share and even show his the weakest side of who he is be vulnerable in front of his wife that's not a good relationship the prophet ﷺ, in his most vulnerable moments would turn only to khadija she never judged him so if, if husband and wife judge each other they haven't worked right to build a relationship that doesn't mean okay they should get divorced some sometimes people jump to this conclusion no what it means okay what can I do now to fix it what can I do to improve it it's not say fix it but what can I do to improve it now oh I'm 60 years old I've been married for 40 years now but I don't feel comfortable, you know, really opening up to my wife. Well, okay, it's never too late. It's never too late. So actually the Prophet ﷺ, one of the most important support systems that he had, probably the, the most important support system he had in his life was his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And this is where the second comes in.
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that one of the wisdoms why he created uh, spouses, created us as spouses, لَكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا He made from amongst yourselves spouses. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So you find peace when you retire to them. You find, well actually there's no one word to explain sukna or sakan. Sakan means, sakan means residence. Means residence. Man, you find residence, you know, when you, when you, when you go back to spend time with your spouse. What does that mean? It's a retiring place. It's when you don't have to put on any mask. You are who you are. You're so vulnerable, you're so open. Because if a human being, by the way, hides their feelings, they can never feel comfortable. If you're not in peace with your feelings in a certain situation, you feel being judged. People around you are critical. So the, the place where you should have no judgment, no fear of judgment, where you can really find this sukna, this peace, this tranquility, this comfort, is at home with your spouse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the reason He made you spouse is that you'll find this feeling, that you're so comfortable, you're so comfortable with your spouse. So if you can't find this, what's the point? If you can't find this, what's the point? Allah is saying that's the wisdom. Obviously, there are other wisdoms like reproduction. But that's a very important factor. Having this kind of relationship. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah blessed him with a wife like this. With a wife like this. And this shows really a lot of the... Uh, this is why they say in Arabic, I'm not sure, probably I think Arabs bor even borrowed that from non-Arabs. It said, وَرَاءَ كُلِّ رَجُلٍ عَظِيمٍ امرأة. Behind every great man, there is a woman. Behind every great man, there is a woman. Because if the man is not comfortable at home, there's no place to recharge. There's no place to build himself again. Because the wear and tear outside in the world, especially these days, is, is, is very overwhelming. And we human beings are essentially relational in the sense we thrive on connection, human connection. That's how we rejuvenate. This is why they say a man by himself is no man. Humans cannot live alone. You might say, I don't want to depend on anyone. I want to do it by myself. You're not going to do anything. That's not the nature of human beings. Human beings are all about relationships. That's how we thrive. That's how we grow. This is why in Islam you find a lot of community. This is why you find the Salah is in congregation. Allah could have just made humans. They could reproduce without mating. But Allah didn't do it like this because humans need that kind of relationship. And that's why Allah is Ahad. Because He's a Samad. He doesn't need anyone. He stands alone. By the creatures, no one stands alone. It's part of who we are. If you fight against this nature, you're just destroying yourself. We humans need that kind of safety, that kind of peace where we can confide into someone. We can open up and just be ourselves and not hide our emotions, not fight our emotions. Just be who we are. Just relax. Because the moment you hold back your emotions or you deny your emotions, and that's what you need to do mostly outside because there's a lot of eyes latching on you, trying to put you down, critique you, criticize you, find a fault in you. Not because there's something wrong with you, but because of their own problems. People criticize you now because you have issues. You might have an issue, right? But the reason people are crit criticizing you is not because they're worried about your problems. Because they have problems, but they don't know how to heal them, how to treat them, so they, can, they take it on you. That's how humans behave. That, that's the psychology behind criticism, by the most of criticism. So, if a man or a woman cannot find a place or a space where they can just be themselves without wearing any mask, without pretending, they, they'll die early. <laughs> they will die early. Life will be very difficult for them. Very difficult for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the Prophet وسلم, by having this wonderful wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. Look at the most difficult time in the life of the Prophet وسلم, who was behind him. Khadija radiallahu anha. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ remembered her over and over again after her death. And even the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha had a sister called Hala. Hala. Bismillah. In Medina, 
the Prophet ﷺ would be in his house. Sometimes Hala would come and visit the wives of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. If the Prophet ﷺ heard the sound or the voice of, of Hala, he would say, Allahumma Hala. He said, Oh Allah, Hala is here. He would be so happy to hear the voice of Hala, the sister of Khadija. And he would go and greet her. He would go and greet her. Even the Prophet ﷺ would mention Khadija. You know when the Prophet ﷺ, like when they slaughtered a, sh a lamb, a, a, a ram or a sheep or anything, or a camel, the Prophet ﷺ would take the best part of that animal and send it to the friends of Khadija. The friends of Khadija. And one day, Aisha radiallahu anha, like she says, Khadija was an old woman. You still remember her? <laughs> like he's still just bringing her name over and over again. The Prophet says to Aisha radiallahu anha, "Amanat bi hina kathbani nas, wa wasatni hina tarakani nas." She believed in me when everyone disbelieved in me. She supported me when everyone let me down. وَكَانَتْ وَكَانَتْ And she was, and she was, and she did, and she did. And he would start numbering so many things, so many of the merits of Khadija, until Aisha said, I wish that he wouldn't just, he would just stop. That's how the Prophet ﷺ kept always remembering Khadija radiallahu anha. Never forgetting her favors and her support. So one of the pillars of success for any human being is to have a supportive spouse who doesn't judge them, who doesn't judge them, who respects them, loves them, supports them, and who accepts the fact that they are human and they have mistakes. Sometimes with our spouses, with our children, like we treat them as if they have to be perfect. If they make one mistake, we go after them. You know, there's no human being, there's no human being without mistakes. If they have no mistakes, they're angels. They're not human beings. It's normal to have faults, to have weaknesses. It's normal. It's just normal. It's normal to fall into sin. It's just human. To expect someone to be perfect is very unrealistic. And it makes you lose that relationship with that person. It makes you critical towards them, judgmental towards them. And once you do this to that person, they will treat you the opposite automatically. Unconsciously, they will just do the same to you. Even though sometimes passively. If they don't have power, they'll do it passively. So you will feel they're judging you. There'll be no relationship. So this is why it's important to have this kind of relationship. It sets you on the right track for you know, being successful, being productive, being healthy, being balanced. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this type of wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, she was the best support ever. And... Uh, so during this period, the Prophet وسلم, things escalated with the Prophet وسلم, and inshallah something big happens during that period of his life, towards his late 30s. Something extraordinary happens that leaves him completely baffled and bewildered. He doesn't know what to do. So inshallah next time, which is, will be next week inshallah, so the halqa is on next week. Uh, if we live till next Friday. Inshallah, we'll see what happened next in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And we'll probably as well talk about Khadija radiallahu anha and her support and her help and what it meant to the Prophet Sallallahu and to the subsequent events in his life and in the history of Islam uh, in general. So, so we'll stop here inshallah. Jazakum Allah khairan wa sallallahu wa ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabihi. We have some time for some questions. So we'll give priority to questions that are related directly to what we were talking about. Anything in the life of the Prophet ﷺ up until this moment. Any questions? Concerns? Yeah. Okay, when the Prophet ﷺ, he bought uh, Zayd and he adopted him as his son. He freed him and adopted his son. And he gave him his name, Zayd ibn Muhammad. This was the practice among the Arabs. Uh, 
And in the early stages of Islam, this as well was the practice. You could adopt someone and take them as your own son and give them your name. But later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a ruling which prohibited this practice. Okay, so it prohibited this practice. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hazab, أُدْعُوهُمْ لِآبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Name them after their real fathers. This is justice with Allah. So he said, do not take them as ado adopted. Yeah. So later on, this was, uh, this ruling was uh, abrogated. It was changed into a pro to a prohibition. So in Islam, you cannot adopt someone and name them after yourself. You can take them into your, uh, into your house and uh, look after them and rear them and so on and so forth, but they don't become your son. You, they don't become your son. And if it's, for example, let's say it's a girl. Maybe there's a girl who's five years old. You adopt her. When she becomes an adult, she has to wear hijab in your presence. She has to wear hijab. She's a stranger to you. She's a stranger to you. Although she grew up in your house. But you can still look after her and provide for her and so on and so forth. But the rulings that apply in Islam to any uh, foreign woman to you, it applies to her as well. Yeah, And also with your children, the same thing. She, she has to cover from your male, from your sons. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? questions okay you know you're aware of the Sira competition right so the books are available in the in the main office there's a Sira competition I think the there's a very good price for first place a very good price price so there's a book and it's nicely written questions and answers it's a it's very easy so the point here is to get more exposure to the life of the Prophet ﷺ by means of this competition so you can get the book and you can read the book and learn because the questions of the competition are going to come from this book. And it's quite comprehensive, but it's easy to go through as well. So it's good to teach it to the kids, to your kids. And it's easy as well because it's question and answer, question and answer. This makes it easier than uh, like a narration, than narrations. So it's something recommended because, uh, and I find it very important with our younger generation, is that they know their history. You know, the way we build our identity as human beings, we have to have some outlook on the past. We need to know where we're coming from. We need to know our history. A nation or a generation that's disconnected from its history has no identity. Has no identity. So we need to have this connection to our history. If we don't know our history, how are we going to take pride in it? How are we going to see ourselves as an extension of, this, of these generations? How are we going to see this? So it's very important to know you know, our history and uh, yeah, to learn our history and especially from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Questions? Yeah. Before what? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, it was the practice of the people of Quraysh that they would touch the idols, Rab, because that's a sort of seeking blessings. In Islam, in Mecca, there are two things you are meant to touch, and they're considered to be an act of worship. Touching the black stone, and if you can kiss it, that would be great. And there is Al-Multazam, which is the door of Al-Kaaba, the area underneath, that's called Al-Multazam. The Prophet Wasallam. He actually attached his body to it. So he would put his hands like this and let his chest, his face, you know, stick to that part of Al-Kaaba. And he would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a form of showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how desperate you are for his help. So that's called Al-Multazam. It's under the gate or the door that you see in Al-Kaaba. The other thing we touch, as we said, is Al-Hajj al-Aswad. Preferably get to kiss it. But make sure you don't get a black eye, someone's elbow, just... And uh, mo most, yeah, like, now it's almost, it's really like, practically it's almost impossible to go there without hurting someone or getting hurt. Really. So, if that's the case, preferably avoid it. Because, 
I mean, it's not worth causing a Muslim harm or getting harmed yourself for that. So yes, these thing, things are true. Any kind, any an, any other kind of rubbing uh, or or seeking blessings physically uh, today, these days, is prohibited. So we don't seek blessings from the graves or the grave of the Prophet وسلم, or anything else. Some people say. Okay, that's a hair from the Prophet ﷺ. That's the sword of the Prophet ﷺ. The problem here is that with what we have today, there's been a lot of forgery in the remains of the Prophet ﷺ, whatever is called hair, whatever is called piece of cloth of the Prophet ﷺ, or his helmet, or his... So for most of the pieces that are available here, there's, a, there's been a lot of forgery. So it's very hard to verify that this is actually from the Prophet ﷺ. So practically speaking, most likely now, there's nothing for us that we touch for blessings except Al-Hajar Al-Aswad and Al-Multazam. Apart from this, practically speaking, there's nothing. So those who go to the graves or go to any blessed place and they rub themselves against it or their hands against it or even someone, the problem sometimes people come to scholars or to you know, righteous people and they start rubbing like their hands against them seeking blessings. That's unacceptable in Islam. That's unacceptable in Islam. The person in front of you is a human being and there's no blessing. The blessings come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. But in, during the life of the Prophet sallam, yes, the Prophet sallam, touching him, anything from him was considered to be blessed. So yes, but practically as we said, most of the remnants were not sure even if they were from the Prophet sallam or not. That's a good question. Uh, Waraq ibn Nawfal was a Christian. And um, so do we say there were Christians in the Arabian Peninsula and was there an influence of the Prophet ﷺ? Some Orientalists use this. They say, okay, he got, there are some people. But the thing is, the Prophet ﷺ had very limited encounters with Waraq ibn Nawfal. The encounter he had was when he first received revelation, Waraq ibn Nawfal. Uh, Khadija radiallahu anha went to Waraq ibn Nawfal, he calmed her down, <coughs> he reassured her, and then he saw the Prophet ﷺ the following day, and we're going to come to this, and he reassured the Prophet ﷺ, calmed him down, and he said, what you were experiencing is the same as what Musa السلام, experienced. And he said, if, when you are sent, I wish that I would be there to defend you. So the Prophet ﷺ had very limited encounters with, with Waraq ibn Nawfal. It's very unlikely that he has learned uh, that he learned anything from him that's it uh, else Waraq ibn Nawfal was a blind man and he kept to himself he wasn't a man a public figure at all so he kept to him he was a hermit so there was he had no students he didn't teach anyone so if the Muhammad Sassam learned from him you would find anyone who teaches you would find students but he had no students he had no followers okay among the Arabian Peninsula yeah, yeah. Najran is t is now considered to be North Yemen, South Saudi Arabia. At those times, there was hardly any connection. There was hardly any connection, and the, so any Christians in the Arabian Peninsula, there was pretty much none in the Arabian Peninsula except for Najran, mainly Najran, and uh, which is to the south of Saudi Arabia now, and it was a small minority, and the Arabs, by the way, held Christianity in a very negative light. Like they took it against Christians that they worshipped a man, or they were, or they they uh, uh, attributed a son to Allah. Like the Arabs saw this in shame. That was that was a source of shame for anyone among the Arabs. So it was like big taboo among. It was as we say, aib among the Arabs today. This, so they had this issue against Christians in general. So they dealt with the Jews in in a better light. But with the Christians, no. The Arabs were went that so much in favor of the Christians at all because they thought their belief didn't make sense at all and it was so much of, as I said, a sense of shame there so they couldn't take it, they didn't take it there was one, we can take one more question before we close, yes no, uh, we don't know if the Prophet, as far as I know uh, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't 
seen any narrations where the Prophet ﷺ mentions a person from Quraysh prior to Islam who will be uh, resurrected by himself in, in or who would be in Jannah. Uh, the, yeah. So it's and the narration doesn't state that he's in Jannah, but it seems to be like that because he says he will be resurrected by himself as one nation. So that's indicative. That this hadith is in uh, Imam Ahmad. It's narrated by Imam Ahmad. Yeah. طيب جزاكم الله خير وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم. So inshallah next week inshallah the halqa will be on again after Maghrib.